Seventy percent of our vehicular traffic on the roads today is two wheelers and three wheelers. Right. And my submission to you is the bulk of them will move to replaceable batteries. Twenty forty seven. That is the Vixit Bharat target. Mm -hmm. Is only twenty three years away. Yes. If you are twenty years now, you'll be forty three years. You'll be in the prime of your youth. Today, you'll find. that you are in a position to determine what the contours of that vikshit bharat will be mm -hmm. in other words you will not only be the beneficiary of that vikshit bharat but you will be the contributor and you will be shaping that vikshit bharat i think that is the main thing we have succeeded in moving 250 million people out of what is called multi dimensional poverty I'm not the kind of person who drops names but i have had the privilege of knowing the prime minister much earlier i see i have known him Not only when I was a diplomat, I have known him even in the earlier before I became a civil servant. I see. He is totally dedicated. He works, I think, eighteen, nineteen hours a day, non-stop, seven days a week, twelve days. But he has a commitment to the country and a passion with which he follows that. As a result of which, you see the transformation in India. I mean, the India of two thousand fourteen and the India of two thousand twenty-four are very different, mm -hmm. and the rate at which we are going, the India of two thousand twenty-nine will be even more different. Mm -hmm. Hardeep Singh Puri ji thank you so much for being on the podcast and thank you so much for hosting me in your beautiful office sir so sir let's talk energy uh, the world has changed a lot in the past 20 years tremendous transformation in terms of uh, energy politics supply chains and all that and you have been a very strong advocate of reforming energy politics and supply chains so what is the role that india plays in this on a note of humility and i want to start on a note of total humility with you the role india plays and the role i play are not necessarily the same i just so happen to be the minister for petroleum and natural gas i've been associated with this ministry since i think 7th july 2021 so it's nearly 3 years but little short there are two or three defining impressions that i have about the global energy situation and i don't think that the uh, experience of 3 years makes me a pandit on it but certainly as somebody who's a hands on professional i can share with you my defining impressions on what is the real issue in the global energy market okay to begin with i think one needs to acknowledge the importance of energy as a driver of economic growth yes the submission i make to you is that you cannot imagine a situation where economic growth can take place or if it is even possible to take place without a requisite energy indeed the concept of energy what constitutes energy has changed over the last few centuries yes and i think the transformation in the coming decades will be of an even more basic nature we started with very basic things you know mankind at the point of evolution used firewood learned the use of turning to the to nature in what was available we went after that to coal to steam and then you that is how the process started there is a belief and i think it's well founded that whoever controls the energy may not control the world but is able to enrich whichever country controls or whichever group controls energy they are yes. able to enrich themselves i'm not saying necessarily to the detriment of the others mm -hmm. but certainly they get a commanding position right so you had a situation where if you take 7 8 year periods and i take 7 8 year periods i did this analysis 2 years ago when the modi government had been around for 8 years today mm -hmm. is 10 years so take a 10 year period when i was a student in the university and you talked about petrol prices and that's when the first oil shock came i see the first oil shock by the way was not so much an oil shock it was a news shock 
somebody realized that energy or petrol which is available for a fraction of a of any cost suddenly could rise hmm okay hmm. if you look into the geopolitical situation in fact one of the most uh, disturbing trends that we get around is one there is no shortage of energy mm -hmm. shortages are deliberately created mm -hmm. in order to upset the equilibrium between demand and supply and in order to be able to keep the price up or to shoot the price up mm -hmm. if you were to look around to engage in a blame game you will find and this is very disturbing that those who controlled the energy were not necessarily the ones who were wanting to drive up the price mm. in fact the driving up the pr price also came from those who were actually import dependent mm. because they thought they could play a game and this is really the great game you talk about great game geopolitically in other thing yes. but this is the energy game mm. something that should cost you cause you meaning anyone who is in the exploration and production business a total of 7 8 dollars to take out mm -hmm. a barrel mm -hmm. 10 dollars 12 dollars a barrel maximum mm -hmm. they want to price it at 100 dollars a barrel yes now the infrastructural costs may be high mm -hmm. a lot of people have invested in terms of capital expenditure maybe mm -hmm. high but nothing justifies a situation where the cost of extraction of a barrel is 12 dollars let's say even 15 dollars to be sold at $100 or $130. Yes. Now I fast forward to that and I come to what you call the traditional fossil fuel industry mm -hmm. which is essentially the extraction of crude oil and its refining in order to produce the petrol and diesel which goes into your vehicles. Before this crisis and I use the word crisis very carefully I'm giving you a reference period. let's say covid was one yes reference point yes if you agree to the analysis that covid reared its ugly head as a once in a lifetime pandemic mm -hmm. much more serious than sars h1n1 swine flu whatever mm -hmm. and this is more like the epidemic which came in 1918 spanish flu spanish flu you take that as a reference period what happened as a result of this pandemic economic activity came to a grinding halt yes so when activity comes to a grinding halt there is no demand for crude oil and the price fell down to $19.56 if i remember correctly i see and then when economic activity lifted crack it started going up so mm -hmm. if the timing of that is end 2019 i think more first few weeks of 2020 mm -hmm. that goes on and there's another shock or a disruption which comes when these russians ukrainian military action that is february of 2022 yes during this reference period at any given point of time what you would call a good oil crude oil mm -hmm. kacha tel production was around 102 million barrels a day a day okay today that 102 million barrels a day thanks to voluntary cuts by opec plus and other factors has been reduced by about 5 million barrels to about 97 million barrels today okay so an artificial shortage has been created mm. yet in spite of that artificial shortage prices have not gone up okay i am told reliably that those who are responsible for the decision making mm -hmm. opec plus are invariably invariably concerned that if they don't do production product, uh, production cuts voluntary or otherwise it will go on falling why because the economic recovery in the world is fragile europe is still in a uncertain state the chinese economy of late has begun to show some signs of getting up but today prices are in the range of 85 dollars plus mm -hmm. per barrel little higher than that that is also on account of another factor and that is that the tensions 
in the Red Sea area. Mm, yes. Where um, starting the immediate causation may be the attacks by the Houthis. Yes. On commercial shipping. Yes. But the background factor is um, Israel, Gaza and all that. Yes. And that is the situation. Mm -hmm. How long will fossil fuel remain? I am, as you are perhaps aware, a very strong advocate of the energy transition. Mm -hmm. I've been fortunate to work with a prime minister who, during his tenure, has pushed up the biofuel blending from 1.4% to about 12% mm -hmm. and is taking, we are by the way, one of the highest biofuel blending countries in the world. Okay. We are doing more biofuel blending than even the United States because our base is bigger. Mm -hmm. And we are going to 20%. Okay. Okay. Now, and our, our feed is di diverse. Mm -hmm. United States makes biofuel only from maize. But what is happening is we are making from sugar, maize. We are doing it from other places. Mm -hmm. I don't know the relative figures, but you know why I'm saying we are probably higher. We, we may be just short. I don't know. But my problem is United States was always a big biofuel producer. Mm -hmm. When I was ambassador to Brazil, the Brazilians prided themselves in being the pioneers in biofuels and the Americans, in order to stop Brazilian biofuels coming in there, they imposed a duty of 56, uh, 56 cents a barrel. By 2025, end of calendar year, we are hoping, or end of fiscal year, take your pick, we are hoping to take this blending from 12% to 20%, which was the target for 2030. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Simultaneously, you see electric vehicles now forming a prominent presence on your roads. Mm -hmm. But again, my submission to you is an electric vehicle is welcome because it doesn't throw out the toxicity on the roads onto the, you know, breathing public. Yes. But at the end of the day, if the grid is still gray, then electric vehicles don't have the same impact which they would have if the grid was entirely green. Indeed. What are we looking at? You are looking at biofuels, 20% blending. Mm -hmm. We are looking at compressed biogas being used. We are looking at compressed natural gas, CNG. Mm -hmm. We are looking at green hydrogen. Okay. Green hydrogen is essentially the fuel of the future. How so, please? Let me explain. Mm -hmm. What do you need to get commercial scale green hydrogen? Mm -hmm. You need to begin with. Cheap clean energy, by which means green energy, which means um, you must be able to produce a unit of solar, which is purely green yes. or any other green energy for a little amount. We have already demonstrated that we can bring the cost of solar energy down from 25 cents to 3 cents. Okay. So we've done. Then you need an electrolyzer. Mm -hmm. An electrolyzer will split the atom water. Yes. In other words, when you produce green energy, what you would get is just water vapor out. Yes. We have done this on a pilot scale. We have done it. When I was Joint Secretary Navy, we used to do it in our submarines because a submarine is by definition a submerged vessel. Indeed, yes. So what happens? You can't get air there. So you take in the water, you use a catalyzer, hmm. electrolyzer, and you take the electrolyzer, you split the acid and you breathe the air. What is the secret of success or the recipe. I wouldn't say success because you need to reach that success. I keep say, repeating that the US Treasury Secretary, not Treasury, sorry, the Energy Secretary, mm -hmm. Jennifer Granholm, mentioned to me that the ambition in green hydrogen is one for one for one. What does that mean? One kilo of green hydrogen for one dollar for 10 years. One in being 10 years, you should be able to do that. Okay. Therefore, the challenge that we've got is how do you produce a kilo of green hydrogen at a lower cost? Mm -hmm. I think if you take the cost today, when I started in this ministry, it was about $3. Today, it is about $2.86. Even not, I'm not so sure because I am only dealing with claims. I have a lot of people who come because we're not testing those claims. I have no doubt that considering that every major manufacturer of electrolyzers is available in it in India now. Okay. Either 
through a collaboration with an Indian entity, commercial entity or on their own mm -hmm. or we have domestic indigenous people, BPCL I think what was, which at the recent India Energy Week, they demonstrated an electrolyzer which the Honorable Prime Minister saw. Okay. I have no doubt that the efforts which are on without making a commitment, they will come down. If it's $2.86, it's $2.90 from 30 to 9, it'll come down, it'll come down. Mm -hmm. But I want to place before you a proposition. Let's say in the next three, four years with all this effort, we are able to bring the cost of green hydrogen down to about $2.40 or $2.45 mm -hmm. per kilo. Okay. What is the amount of money that you're spending on import of fossil fuels? $185 billion a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, ball, rough ballpark figure. I mean, if the consumption goes up, by the way, our Indian consumption of fuel is going up at three times the global average. Indeed. And if the price also goes up, then it'll be not 185. You'll be spending 200. And if the oil, price of oil is not 85, but 100, mm -hmm. then you're spending more than $200 billion on import. Mm -hmm. I make the proposition to you that if you have a policy decision to take, what would you rather do? Spend $185 billion on the import of toxic fossil, fossil fuels or would you say, all right, I'm diverting that money for the production of green hydrogen and instead of you wanted a $1, I mean, I'm sure if you put $200 billion in, I can bring the price down to uh, close to that $1. What is the American, I'm fast forwarding going sideways, hmm? what is the American Inflation Reduction Act. It is an absolutely clearly thought through system to encourage sustainable energy in the form of green energy. And they're putting what, five, six hundred billion dollars into it. I see. Now, the Europeans would want me to call this a subsidy, undisguised subsidy. I'm, I'm, I'm a former chairman of the subsidies committee of the GATT, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. I know okay. a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. A subsidy by definition is something which is a charge on the state exchequer. Mm -hmm. So if the state is spending five, six hundred billion dollars, it is a kind of incentivization or subsidy. Now, India doesn't have the resources of the US, nor does anybody else to spend six hundred dollars. But if it's a choice in terms of a policy decision of shifting from Expenditure on fossil fuels to shifting on green hydrogen. Mm. I can tell you political differences, ideological consideration, everyone will say much better to go to green hydrogen because what will happen? You will be doing climate saving. You will be putting the green energy to use for yourself and your future generation. And that will be a save the planet movement. Mm. How optimistic am I? Yes. I think the target we have of 5 million metric tons per annum by 2030. Okay. 2030 is not far off, by the way. We are already in 2024. Yeah. I think it's a conservative target. Okay. It's a conservative target because green hydrogen is one of those brilliant children, genius in that DNA and everywhere, but it doesn't have a single parent. So everybody is into green hydrogen. My colleague, the MNRE minister thinks he is the headmaster of green hydrogen. My colleague, the steel minister thinks he is the, uh, this thing and rightly so, because they all want an ownership in that. Okay. I keep making one state statement and which is a more important one that green hydrogen will succeed when we start using it in our refineries. Mm. So I have one company which has 11 refineries. They're already using it in two. He's promised he'll put in another two, but I think this competitive urge, to move towards green hydrogen will go. Now we have a cabinet decision and we have a PLI provisioning of 19,700 crores. Mm -hmm. The point I'm making again is, it's good to have a little bit of cabinet ministers saying, no, I will do it, I will do it. But at the end of the day, everyone is moving towards green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a time before we reach the European point that we will only use green steel. I need to get the green hydrogen. If I get enough green hydrogen, I can do it, do whatever I want with it. I can power ships with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like ethanol. Now, if the European Union mandates 
that 5% of the sustainable aviation fuel or what we call aviation turbine fuel, 5% of it has to be sustainable ethanol, mm -hmm. then you'll need more ethanol. And yeah. where are you going to produce the ethanol? You're going to produce it either in Brazil or in India. Right. Because no other country has this kind of, maybe China. Okay. So I am an enthusiast, advocate, and strong supporter of green fuels. Mm -hmm. But unlike other enthusiasts, I also have my feet firmly on the ground. Okay. Because whilst we make the transition, and a transition by definition is something you do from one point to another, I still have to re re uh, rely on fossil fuels. Yes. Therefore, I think with India's demand shooting up, mm -hmm. two things will happen. Our emphasis on exploration and production of traditional fuels will go up. Okay. Our increase in refining capacity will be demonstrated. We were, when I became minister in this, uh, with this ministry, we were about 252 million metric tons per annum. Mm -hmm. I think we should be heading towards 300 now. The prime minister, in fact, when he talks, he talks sometimes of 450, I stop at 400. Okay. We are in the happy situation today, very happy situation that India is progressing on all fronts. Mm -hmm. And I think the credit for that goes to the commitment to on sustainability by the boss, the Honorable Prime Minister, mm -hmm. who in fact changed that position. I mean, up to, up till and about till Paris, the Indian situation, position was very understandable, developing country, not my fault. You, the developed industrialized countries cause the pollution, therefore the polluters pay. We have not given that up. But we are also said that we owe a debt to ourselves and to our next generation. So I can do the blame game. It can go on for till the cows come home. Yep. But I meanwhile need to transit. Yes. I need to transit. I need to transition. So we have started that. Mm -hmm. So I think that today with reasonable confidence, I can say that our biofuel story will succeed. Our CBG story will succeed. So what's CBG? Compressed biogas. Compressed biogas. Our making of biofuels, second generation comes from making it from agricultural waste. Mm -hmm. We will even make a third generation biofuels from industrial gases. Our CNG production is going up by what? 18% every year. Okay. But we are still 50% dependent. Okay. Our import dependence on crude oil was 85%, but with the economy booming, it's gone up to 87, 88%. I see. But that is because of the criminal neglect earlier. Mm. We had not put the emphasis on ENP 10 years ago or 15 years ago. We're doing it now. So what's ENP? Exploration and production. Got it. Now we have, and I want to wind up this section of our discussion. We mm. have something like 3.5 million square kilometers mm. of sedimentary basin. Okay. But the problem is, there's no point that you're having a sedimentary basis where you can go and prospect and find oil and gas. You're not able to access it. Yeah. So what we did last year, if I remember correctly, we opened up 1 million square kilometers of that sedimentary basin to exploration and production. Okay. And it's already showing result. Second thing, people, you know, there are only four or five big companies in the world. You can, I can name them. Chevron, Exxon, BP, and so on. Mm -hmm. They will come and explore, provided they have a guarantee that once they find the oil, they're going to be part of the action. Yes. Now, countries which are very vulnerable, they don't have any hesitation in handing it all over to them so that you come and spend your money and then oil becomes yours. They get a small trickle. India is not like that. Mm -hmm. But today we have gone into a situation where we are happy to partner with them and told them, if you have any problem in spending your money, we will even incentivize your exploration and production. Okay. And we will, and we'll give you the data. So mm -hmm. we've taken all the data from the sedimentary basin. We have sent it to the University of Texas in Houston, okay. United States, and there it's available for anybody who wants to access. You see, once you have the data available, then you can use your experts mm -hmm. to do a forensic and find out kaha pe milega. Mm -hmm. And I think one of those companies remind me is you spending 20, Exxon is spending 20% of its super computing capacity on analyzing Indian data. I see. So we have a very good prospect. Further increases in biofuel, mm -hmm. ethanol made from sugar, maize, uh, 
Parali agricultural waste. Third generation, we have two, two generation plants operating, one in Panipat, elsewhere. Compressed biogas, we are now going into it in a big way. Mm -hmm. CNG, cars are coming on CNG. We have now laid a pipeline. I think our pipeline today has gone up from 14,000 kilometers in 2014 to about 22,500 kilometers. And I, we are going to take that pipeline another uh, 11,000 kilometers to about 33,000 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So the whole country will be covered by a pipeline for natural gas. We import it. We, uh, it comes either in liquid form. We uh, gasify it, send it or whatever the plants are required at the ports are there. Mm -hmm. And I think the green hydrogen story about which not much is known. It is beginning to register in a big way. Mm -hmm. Why do I say this? Let me tell you. There are little signs. If a refinery moves from say it's traditional feed into green hydrogen, into the making of green hydrogen, I think it's a very positive sign. If um, people have uh, water transport moving on uh, green hydrogen, as we saw, I think a demonstration project in Kerala recently, if I remember correctly. Okay. If we have big buses doing demonstration rides in Delhi, mm -hmm. 15 of them are going to be plying, you know, as demonstration, not charging any fees, but shows that you can, you know, hop in and hop out of a bus. It's using green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. I flagged off one or two buses, I think, from the uh, national stadium. Mm -hmm. If you look at all this, I think issues of energy availability, energy affordability and sustainability are being well addressed. Mm -hmm. Why is availability crucial? Because a country like India is no longer even remembers that there's a shortage of energy anywhere. We don't. No, luckily, but mm -hmm. there was a time recently when there were massive floods and flood like flood like situation mm -hmm. in uh, the Northeast. But our OMC sent their uh, distributors with cylinders on their shoulders to the points of consumption. Mm -hmm. Affordability, we are the only country in the world where prices over a two or a three year reference period have actually come down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have uh, Mavericks like one politician who said, 400 par ki baat isli ho gaye kyunki petrol sa saw se upar hai. I saw about 100 guys trolling him, telling him, by the only place where petrol to cost over 100 rupees are the non BJP states and few of them. Okay. And the states with which he is associated. Mm -hmm. All the BJP states, it's 90 plus. And there's a difference, and this is more important, of 14, 15 rupees per liter mm -hmm. of petrol and about 10, 11 rupees of uh, liter per liter of diesel. Finally, on sustainability, as I said, you need to have availability, affordability. Rest of the world prices were going up 40%, 43%. India came down 2%, 3%. And finally, sustainability. And I told you, I spent more time on sustainability because I think that is where the discussion is going to take place. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to share with you one final comment. Mm -hmm. Will the transport systems of the future be based on one or the other? I said, no, I think they will get a hybrid model. Okay. And then the most successful cars will be, I mean, four wheelers will be those that use electric and biofuels. Okay. Like the Japanese Toyota Mirai, this is Nigam. Mm -hmm. I mean, hybrid, electric and petrol will go on till you get more ethanol. Yes. So that's why one of my companies has now launched what is called E100. I want to tell you, Prime Minister launched something called E20, that is 20% blended mm -hmm. fuel yeah. during the India Energy Week in Bengaluru last year. Okay. We already have it flying in what, 12,000 retail points. But recently, I think a month ago, one of the companies introduced an E100. So in about 400 dispensing stations in two or three states, you have E100 being marketed. Okay. So you can go and get E100. Now, what happens is once you have E100, a lot of people will go and switch from petrol to ethanol. Mm -hmm. But you need availability. Now, in Brazil, when I was ambassador, I could, I could remember you would go to a dispensing station in the morning, depending on the price of petrol, which was necessarily determined by the international price. Yes. And the price of ethanol, you could decide whether you want 40% of one and 60% of the other or the other way around, 60% of ethanol and 40% of petrol. Mm -hmm. I believe choice. If you are a driver and you're filling up 30 liters, 
you might even come to a situation if ethanol is slightly more expensive than petrol mm -hmm. but because you know that petrol is toxic and will produce no toxic um, vapors yeah. you might say no i'll go for uh, this thing mm. i'll go for uh, the cleaner fuel even mm. if it's a little more expensive mm. earlier we were getting resistance from the automobile manufacturers no it's called the society of indian automobile Manuf manufacturer cm they said nahi abhi to bik rahi hai what's the point i had to bring in a delegation from brazil because same manufacturers who here sell cars why was 20% blending introduced because people said up to a 20% blend you don't need to change any parts of the car okay because there's no corrosion mm. but you know those same guys were selling e85 cars in brazil so now what's happened they want to sell e85 cars here mm. so i think there's a very strong transformation which is underway it's like a silent revolution and i think before we know hamare yahan to bhed chal hoti hai before you know everybody will move towards this thing mm. 70% of our vehicular traffic on the roads today is two wheelers and three wheelers right and my submission to you is the bulk of them will move to replaceable batteries okay lithium ion batteries apps okay you mentioned the sedimentary uh, basin basin so is this located onshore or offshore it is offshore i see it's offshore offshore all right got it so um, this global biofuels alliance that india is, yeah. is championing yeah. can you speak about that i'm very happily hmm. You see, when I was ambassador in Brazil, I used to go to an organization called Unica. Unica. Unica is the Brazilian cooperative entity for all biofuel manufacturers, ethanol manufacturers. Okay. One of my first conversations with the president of Unica, and I think the year was two thousand and six, was that ambassador, how I wish if India takes to biofuels. India states ma starts manufacturing ethanol. I said, "Why do you say that?" He said, "You know, Brazil and the United States are already here, but the United States is not going to be making ethanol except for its own use. Mm -hmm. But if India could join, India, Brazil, United States could actually end up forming a biofuels equivalent of OPEC. Okay, OPEC are the manufacturer and uh, not the, the the producers of uh, fossil fuels those who have the most like you know the countries of the gulf etc yes and you could do it and we could make a great success of it in terms of making biofuels an internationally traded commodity mm -hmm. well that idea remained with me at that point the government in delhi actually wanted to move to biofuels and they wanted or they set themselves a target of 5% blending in 10 of our states and union territories okay which worked out and they didn't succeed to 1.4 because if you want any transformation of like that you will have to produce the ecosystem whereby the producer will get a remunerative return somebody will take it look there are problems all the time even now there's a problem sugar today i read a report now sugar is going to be plentifully available for ethanol but if there's a problem they say ethanol karo chini must go to the consumer these things start working themselves out if you have an ecosystem okay So from 2006 to India's presidency of the G20 and a resolute and far-sighted prime minister we got a global biofuels alliance going mm -hmm. all the important international organizations of the world are a member of that mm -hmm. I think we got about 28 countries or something like that if I remember correctly or okay. more are joining uh -huh. clearly there are 193 members of the United Nations but every country will not want to join the biofuels alliance only those who are interested mm -hmm. because biofuels either you produce and sell or those who want to buy but very interesting some of the opec members are wanting to join see. because they see in this a potential uh -huh. for instance when the, you had the launch of the global biofuels alliance in delhi i clearly remember our prime minister there we had the americans there we had the singaporeans there we had i think uae as a as a there because they think that they will also move towards this thing and we had about 8 9 heads of state and government standing there mm -hmm. but i think this is an idea whose time has come and i think going forward from here you will hear more about the global biofuels alliance mm -hmm. the beauty of it is it is not a intergovernmental agreement in the traditional sense of the word okay what happens in intergovernmental agreement is you have a lot of babus taking over i see you know 
I'm, I'm, I've been a civil servant for 39 years, so please, I don't want your podcast to suggest that I have anything against uh, Babus. But you know, I think something like the Biofuels Alliance will succeed and can succeed only if all the stakeholders get involved. Hmm. Now, we have a company in India, I'm not doing commercial, which has made and sold 1,000 biofuel plants in 100 countries of the world. I see. So I keep saying, why should the governments only contribute to it? It's the biofuels industry should contribute to it. Mm -hmm. And that biofuels industry will be the bigger gainer. Mm -hmm. I had an interaction during the G20 um, ministerial meet in Goa okay. with the environment minister, I think, of Kenya. And okay. she said, I've heard a lot about the Indian biofuel story. I would like you to send a delegation. So I said, instead of my sending a delegation of, of government officials or only the PSUs, let's get a delegation of private sector, etc. And you know, there are such heartwarming stories. I was told that there was a trader in Ahmedabad who has supplied a million, million cooktops to Kenya. Okay. And what do those cooktops do? They use, because you know, not all countries in the world are as fortunate as India is in, in, of having domestic uh, LPG connections, yes. etc. Mm -hmm. So there, this trader, what he does is he sells these cooktops and he has a counterpart there who imports 93 octane ethanol from Brazil. Okay. So the guy sitting in Ahmedabad is providing the cooktops. Mm. Somebody sitting in Brazil is providing 93 octane biofuel and it comes here and Kenya has clean cooking mm -hmm. because ethanol is totally clean. So, so these are the, the potential, you know, once the idea gets going, the technology, the best practices, plus it's a great boon to the agriculture sector. One of my favorite um, pieces of uh, statistics is that when we completed 10% of blending at that time with the rates prevalent then, we saved 41,000 crores I see. on import bill. Okay. And as a result of which we were able to pay our agricultural sector 42,400 crore. Mm -hmm. Of all the biofuel blending which you've done from the beginning to now, I think we would have saved about 80,000 crores or so. Mm -hmm. Now, just imagine that's the situation now. What happens when you do 20% blending? Yes. So it is virtually at 10% you did 41,000 crores. If you do 20%, it'll be double of that. Yes. So it's a win-win for agriculture. Plus, it introduces economic activity. And when I was in UP, it was mind-boggling. Some of those areas which are getting the CBG plants have no other industry there. I see. So, in a predominantly agricultural setting, if you go in and set up a CBG plant, that's when you go forward. Mm -hmm. So, energy and climate change are significantly... Totally, correlated. totally. Now, there's a significant need to reduce the carbon output and all that. And we need to, we have targets for 2017 and all that. What do you think the global uh, consensus is like? Are we going to be able to achieve it? Is there progress on that front? So, I'm not in a position to make an assessment of um, how the world at large, which mm. means 193 countries will fare. It's possible, not possible to highlight. I can give you two or three, again, abiding impressions from my side. Mm -hmm. The Millennium Development Goals, which were set up, in pursuance of work done by the OECD, which is a think tank of the West. Mm -hmm. They succeeded largely because China succeeded in lifting millions of people out of poverty. Yes. With a little bit of help from India, South Africa, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. The sustainable development goals, which are now bringing the sustainable element mm -hmm. and the COP negotiation, they will succeed because India will succeed. Okay. And because India will succeed, the SDGs, which is Agenda 30, 2030, will also succeed. Mm -hmm. The very interesting catch there. Earlier, the MDGs were conceptualized and the intellectual work was done by the OECD. So okay. they en ended up, because the OECD is the West, industrial West, mm -hmm. it came out in the form of prescriptions, which means I sit and do my work in my office. Then I say, sh 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 you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. You have to be a prescription, which is an absurdity. Mm. Whereas the SDGs, when I was ambassador there, we said, now we must learn from this experience. We must turn it on its head. The, the inspiration must come from the ground upwards. Mm. And therefore, the SDGs in India. Now, I just tell you, if you look at the last 10 years figures, we have succeeded in moving 250 million people 
out of what is called multidimensional poverty. Yes. People saying what is abject poverty. I said, you can set any yardstick that you like. Hmm. Earlier, the yardsticks would be $1 a day per person, per family. Ah, forget it. You take multidimensional poverty in its most comprehensive form. And India has lifted 25 crore or 250 million people out of multidimensional poverty in 10 years. In 10 years. In 10 years. Hmm. Now, by doing that and going through the biofuels, by going through the uh, CNG route, by the work you are doing, when this, uh, you, you, I'm, I'm referring to this only because you referred to it, you talked about net zero in yeah. 2017. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, hmm. I said, how far What is the target on an average for the industrial? 2040, 2045? You take my set of statistics. I can speak on behalf of my oil companies, OMCs. If you look at their targets, all their targets are, I think, 2030 onwards to 2045. Mm -hmm. So that 2070 is a national level target because it is a country where uh, development is at the heart and the Prime Minister has succeeded in taking the benefits of development, Sarvodaya to Antyodaya, to the farthest part. Mm -hmm. So 2070 is a safety catch feature. But most of our oil companies, are looking at this, I think, from EIL to IOCL, they're all between 2030 and 2040, 45. Mm. And they will go totally green. Mm. Let's move to housing and uh, urban development. The Smart Cities mission was uh, initiated in 2015, and you have been significantly at the core of that. What is it that makes a city a smart city? And what do smart villages have to do with this? No, it's like this. This is a novel scheme, mm -hmm. which, as you said, was introduced in, implemented and introduced in June 2015. Mm -hmm. When we were writing the manifesto of the Bharatiya Janata Party before the 2014 election, uh -huh. I think not many of us were aware then or not many people in the world were aware of what a smart city would be. So what we did was something very basic. We said in the manifesto that when we come to power, we will make 100 new smart cities. Mm -hmm. We make 100 smart cities, which means new smart cities. Okay. When we started getting down to it, we suddenly realized we didn't know what we were talking about. Okay. Because there are already cities. So that brings your question, what makes a city smart? Indeed. So we followed two private. We went, went in for a system of election. Okay. We invited all the country. There are many cities in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. I think the total number of statutory bodies was 4,800 or, or something like that. Okay. So we were only making 100. So we called a competition. Let every city, apart from the capital city in a state which could get a preferential treatment. Tell us what you would want to do in a smart city. Give us a number of projects. Okay. So we followed two examples. One is area-based development. So Delhi is a very big city. But the New Delhi Municipal Corporation, NDMC, New Delhi is a smart city. Okay. So what does it do? It has smart garbage collection. It has smart X, smart Y, smart Z, so on. That's it. Mm -hmm. The others... So out of 190 became area-based development and 10 became greenfield, which means where there was no city like New Raipur, that's a smart city. There we are building from, you know, when you're building a new smart city of greenfield, it's much easier mm -hmm. because then you're starting everything according. Here you're taking, you have to transform the old into the new. It's one of the most successful schemes where very little money has been spent by the government. Okay. And there's also, I think the total is about 200,000 crores or uh, 2 lakh crores. 2, <laughs> two lakh crores. I think 17% um, or something is um, a private public partnership, about 47,000 crores. There are about 9,000, how many projects? Most of them have been done. And the problem is, it's all 100 cities didn't start at the same time. Okay. You conceptualize the scheme in June 2015. Mm -hmm. First tranche was in January 2016. And you were declaring the smart cities as date is 2018 19. Okay. So it normally takes five years. So many of them are ready. Mm -hmm. At the heart of the smart city is what is called an integrated command and control center. Okay. Where, and if you have the time, I'd like to take you to the urban observatory in, um, in Nirman Bhavan. Okay. Where you can see all the development projects of the country on a big screen. Okay. And say what is being done here, what is being done there. I see. Now, in the smart cities, these were 100. But now, immediately after you finalize the 100, a lot of people come and say, Sir, we have smart city. Now, in the follow-up, 
you will exp- you will take advantage of the le- learning mm-hmm. the experience and now people want to do smart villages smart district a lot of people are coming up with this i suggest you wait for the uh, manifesto and the plans f- for our third term okay that i think we will take those decisions then all right so what's the swanidhi scheme and what uh, is the impact of that is one of the most fantastic schemes of digital and financial inclusion okay what happened is that suddenly during the emergence and uh, uh, during the covid mm-hmm. we learned some very bitter lessons okay see all our schemes started in june 2015 pradhan mantri awas yojana take rural and urban together 4 lakh 4 crore houses we built 11 crore toilets we did amrut scheme swachh bharat mission mm-hmm. but one of the things we saw and prime minister is very sensitive to the plight of those who are the most vulnerable sections of our society mm-hmm. we discovered that the poor street vendors who by definition go to money lenders and borrow money at exorbitant usury rates mm-hmm. they borrow the money they bring their wares they do the commercial retailing on the footpath or wherever they can find place where they are not harassed by authorities or they are harassed by authorities they are still doing it mm-hmm. and then they go and return money to the money lender yes so yes. we came up with a fantastic scheme i think it was rolled out in the year of the pandemic 2020 may of 2022 okay and it within 30 days we had the scheme started the ingredients of the scheme are 10000 rupees first loan without collateral if you pay that back 20000 rupees second loan okay if you pay that back another 50000 rupees third loan okay very interesting most of the street lenders were actually in deep debt okay so i suspect most of them use the first tranche of the loan to pay back their old debts i see and then they somehow managed and then the scheme just took off i see today if i remember correctly the total number of loans that have been handed out are about 83 lakhs and the total number of street vendors is about 65 lakhs or so have number of people who got the loan okay which means most of them got the first loan several second and several got the third loan we had a big mela in delhi also where we distributed these loans you know mr mohammed yunus the bangladesh economist introduced it hmm. but india is the first place where you have not only improvised on the scheme but you showed that it can be a roaring success now okay. what you do is typically you go to a bank hmm. you ask for a loan they make it easy first of all people turned around and said why would the banks do unke liye to kuch nahi hai isme they not any interest no i think the public sector banks did a great job today the guys who received the note uh, the loans their data was taken on boarded and they became beneficiaries of all the other pr- prime minister schemes so you not only got a loan you also got the benefits of the other schemes i see and as a result of which the street vendors moved in a sense from the informal economy to the formal economy and apart from moving to the formal economy they also became people with spending power and there's a study done by i think uh, an economist in the state bank of india somya kanti ghosh if my figure my memory serves me correct who's done a study of the credit uh, spending of these street vendors it makes a fascinating uh, read i see right so you've been a diplomat you have a substantial amount of experience in diplomacy how did that help in your political career and in your, in, in the you know ministries no i mean if your question is how did i make the transition from a world as a civil servant to a politician or from diplomacy to politics the answer is very simple i mean um, you have to work hard there you have to work hard the issues are different yes i used to work um, i was the secretary general of something called the independent commission on multilateralism okay which was ch- chaired by a gentleman who was very well known kevin rudd who was the prime minister of australia okay So when I became Minister for Housing and Urban Affairs in September 2017, somebody told Rudd, uh, my friend Kevin, that um, Hardeep has become Minister for Housing and Urban Affairs, and you know he had an instinctive. He said, "Find out 
how many of the 17 sustainable development goals does his ministry deal with? And we're shocked. Out of the 17, we dealt with five or six. I see. We deal. I mean, you see, the Housing and Urban Affairs Ministry was earlier three separate ministries. One of the ministries was poverty alleviation. And one of the goals is uh, abject poverty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Secondly, SDG 5, women's empowerment. All our schemes are an anchored in women um, uh, centered development. If you make a shochale or a toilet, we built 11 crores of them. Who is the beneficiary? The girl child. Yes. Otherwise, the girl child, girl and the mother have to go out to defecate out in the field. SDG 11, inclusive city. So, I don't think, I think the world of a civil servant is different. I think it gives you some training uh, to read and write and to understand issues. But I think the rest of it is um, intuitive. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that every civil servant may, will make a good politician. I'm not even sure if I'm a good politician. But I think your question is more on the transition. And I think um, a lot of civil servants have done very well in their new profession. A lot, many more have not done well. Hmm. So the issue is... Um, a question of, you know, you utilize what you learn in, as a set of skills and you bring them on to your next profession. See how you go from there. How has it been working with the Prime Minister? Working no, for it's, the Prime a, Minister? it's a absolute once in a lifetime experience. By the way, I'm, the, not, I'm not the kind of person who drops names, but I've had the privilege of knowing the Prime Minister much earlier. I see. I've known him not only when I was a diplomat, I've known him even in the earlier, before I became a civil servant. I see. I can only tell you that in my 50 plus years of public life, I have still to come across any individual who comes even within close range. He is totally dedicated. He works, I think, 18, 19 hours a day, nonstop, seven days a week, 12 days. But he has a commitment to the country and a passion with which he follows that. As a result of which you see the transformation in India. I mean, the India of 2004 and the uh, 14 and the India of 2024 are very different. Mm -hmm. And the rate at which we are going, the India of 2029 will be even more different. Mm -hmm. Not the economic progress alone, but, you know, also, I think the vision he has. Green energy is a case in point. Um, you know, uh, you see the transformation is taking place and being felt in our tier two, tier three cities in our rural areas. And I think that is encompassed in what is his vision of a Viksit Bharat. Mm -hmm. And I think that sums it up. That is now the mission statement. Okay. And that Viksit Bharat journey, which he started in 2014, I think it will continue for another five years under his leadership. And then we'll see where we are going. Mm -hmm. But the country slowly moved from being the 10th largest economy in 2014 to the 5th largest. And I think can say with a reasonable degree of confidence by 2027, we'll be one of the three top economies. Yes, indeed. So the elections are coming up and uh, is what, what is being said. What's your message to the first time voters? There's a very large pool of first time voters who are going to come up. I read a statistic somewhere that total elected is about 860 million. Okay. 86 crores or something. Mm -hmm. The first time voters are very strong, large percentage of that. I don't remember 17% somebody told me or I don't know the percentage. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it's a smaller percent the first time, but you don't know. The point is, it's a very strong vote. I'll correct this in the, as we go along in the, in the thing. Okay. I have spent a long, a very, very significant point of time talking to young voters. I see. When I talk to them, I make three points. One is, I wish I was 50 years younger and I was a, in your place. I was in Coimbatore. I had 1,500 students in an in, in, in engineering college and, uh, and not only from Coimbatore, but from several other cities. Mm -hmm. And I came to the conclusion, I said, look, you're very young because when I left the university, I had a very limited choice of what one could look for in a profession. If you are a very good student, you could become a lecturer after a postgraduate degree. There were three or four private sector companies you could join for or did what all bright students did, appear for the IAS and try and get in. Yes. But I think the second more important thing is, so you are spoiled for choice. Today, yes. Today, you are not only entering the job market, you are actually entering an economy where you will be job providers. Look at the number of startups and all those things. But the most important thing is, 2047, 
that is the Vixit Bharat target, mm -hmm. is only 23 years away. Yes. If you're 20 years now, you'll be 43 years. You'll be in the prime of your youth. Today, you'll find that you are in a position to determine what the contours of that Vixit Bharat will be. Mm -hmm. In other words, you will not only be the beneficiary of that Vixit Bharat, but you will be the contributor and you will be shaping that Vixit Bharat. I think that is the main thing. Right. Final question, what can we look forward to in the next five years? What sort of development? Well, I'll tell you something. Um, this is a very once in a once, this kind of government you don't get very often. We do not. We are already looking at what are the actions in the first 90 days. Hmm. What are the, what the, some of it will come out in the manifesto in terms of overall program. But I think every ministry has already been tasked with the job of providing a blueprint. Mm -hmm. I can't second guess. I can tell you when my two ministries, we will be going for uh, an expansion. There were some schemes we couldn't get done. Uh, they were, uh, today, because we are in a code of conduct, I can't speak uh, because, it, I, you know, your uh, show will be uh, telecast or you'll go on YouTube. Uh, and I'll, I'll be violating the code. But, but I think on each front, there are some fascinating things which are due. Carrying to its logical conclusion, the programs we've already started, mm -hmm. many new programs, some of them already being talked about in the press. Mm -hmm. no, no matter how much we try to keep them under a lid. But at the end of the day, good ideas have a habit of uh, finding expression. Indeed, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank have you some so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that was the conversation. Hope you liked it. If you enjoyed this, please share this on WhatsApp and other media. Thank you very much. And I'll see you soon.